Go Bulldogs. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you. Welcome to Nashville. Yeah. I don't own boots, but I learned that I need to. Uh, I learned that I need to. Thank you. Uh, 2014 annual conference um, for NASIO. Um, I have, uh, it's been a, a, a wild pleasure to serve as president this last year. We have a great, great um, program that we have put together for you uh, for today. So I'm going to officially call us uh, to uh, get together and get going this morning. Um, it's always nice when you're the person breaking records. Um, 660 registrants, uh, which is a record for an annual conference. So, yeah. You'll be hearing from Stu Davis, our uh, vice president and programs chair, and uh, Allison and the other staff put on, uh, do great, great work um, getting these numbers where they need to be. Um, so 51 states represented, uh, 660 registrants, is 51 states represented, so pretty, uh, pretty amazing. NASIO is a, is a unique organization. It's filled with uh, state CIOs, uh, and we are here with a lot of other friends as well, from institutions of higher learning, from nonprofits, local governments, international governments, and I'm going to talk through um, a list of some of those uh, folks that are here that always are uh, good partners uh, with us together. A public Technology Institute, uh, many of those folks will be joining us. They were with us yesterday. And I got to say hello to several folks, um, always a good bunch. Tech America, uh, Office of Management and Budget, National Association of State Budget Directors, CIOs love budget directors. Absolutely. National Association of State Technology Directors, National Association of State Procurement Officers, the Center for Digital Government, MSI SAC, and the Nashville Technology Council. I'd like to take a few minutes. This is uh, a, a stamina test for me to read through our corporate members and sponsors. Uh, corporate involvement is not only very important, it is uh, really the benchmark, the foundational piece for us to put on a very great conference um, once a year at our annual. Corporate members participate on committees. They assist in the production of work products. Uh, NASIO has a couple of brand new work products uh, that are coming out. We just took a look at our CIO survey and of course our security work is going to be coming out on Wednesday, which is a big, big day that Stu will be telling you about. So the support of NASIO's 119 corporate members is absolutely essential to fostering the uh, mission of the organization, uh, excellence through quality business practices, information management, and technology policy, all of which are critical to moving technology forward in the states and the advocacy work that the association does. The ongoing support of our members and sponsors allows NASIO to continue its work. So here goes. Our thanks goes out to our Pinnacle sponsors, CA Technologies and Deloitte. Our gold sponsors, let me get through them. It's going to take me a while. Thank you. Our gold sponsors, Accenture, Amazon Web Services, AT&T, BMC Software, CenturyLink, CGI, Dell, EMC, ESRI, FireEye, First Data, HP, IBM, Intel. NIO, KPMG, Livono, Morpho Trust, NetApp, NIC, NTT Data, Oracle, Palo Alto Networks, SAP, Splunk, Symantec, Unisys, Verizon, Workday, and Xerox. Slide guys are keeping up good. Silver sponsors, Excella, Brocade, Capgemini, Citrix, Dell Tech, Gartner, Infor Global Solutions, Informatica, Microsoft, Motorola Solutions, Northrop Grumman, Novell, SAIC, ServiceNow, Software AG, and Vion. Our bronze sponsors, AppPoint Public Sector, CDWG, General Dynamics, Infosys Public Services, Pegasus Systems, SafeNet, Tenable Network Security, Teradata Tripwire, and VMware. Our interactive technology sponsors, Acquia, EngagePoint, our member center sponsor is Google. Our Wi-Fi sponsor is Tata Consultancy Services. Our communication sponsor is Cisco. Our media sponsors, Fierce Government IT, GCN Governing, Government Executive, Government Technologies, i360Gov, Public CIO, and State Scoop. Ladies and gentlemen, round.
The Interact Technology sponsors we've provided questions, so let's warm up as we typically do at our conference with a few questions. You've got your keypad on the table. This one is for everyone. Okay. Is this your first NASIO conference? Yes or no? Okay. First NASIO conference, yes or no? Wow, okay. That's some repeaters. 31% first time. What about um, is this your first visit to the Music City? Yes or no? First visit to the Music City. Just about the same, okay? Very good, very good, thank you. Um, we are absolutely delighted to be in Nashville, as I said. Um, I've been out and about uh, a couple of nights and uh, have uh, very much enjoyed downtown Nashville. We have a, a video uh, to give you kind of a flavor for the area. So we have a couple minute video that we're gonna roll, okay? I'm going to be thinking of fried chicken the rest of the day. It only took one scene. <clears throat> I have the uh, very, very distinct pleasure of um, welcoming Greg Adams to the stage. Uh, I got a chance to meet Greg this summer uh, at NGA. Um, he is the uh, serving currently as the chief operating officer 
for the state of Tennessee. He joined the governor's uh, team in July of 2013 after working for IBM for 36 years. Uh, today's Greg role is to work with the state's departments to ensure they're operating in the most effective and efficient way possible. Greg, come on up. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, Governor Haslam, let me welcome you to the state of Tennessee. Hopefully, when you saw that video, you get a sense of kind of the excitement and how we feel about things going on in the state. We've got uh, jobs are growing, housing starts are growing. Uh, we just passed some legislation in the spring where for every high school student in the state of Tennessee, we will provide for them at no charge two years of community or technical college. So we've already had 23,000. <laughs> We've already had 23,000 high school kids sign up for it, and the, the deadline is November 1st. And again, the strategy is this could be the last chance for so many of these kids to get an education and to provide the kind of labor market for Tennessee that, as you guys know, competing with us, we want to be the best place for jobs. So, so exciting things you know, going on you know, across the state. And, being in the south, but you can tell by my accent, I'm not from the south, but I love the hospitality here. And uh, those of you that follow all the kind of the new websites and things that are going on, uh, Airbnb, which I think is a great, you know, that's the website that allows you to do a bed and breakfast in your home. They do great customer surveys, you know, because obviously they're hosting, you know, the folks that are running these bed and breakfasts. Nashville and Memphis are two of the top ten most hospital cities, you know, in the United States. So welcome, enjoy your stay here, and take advantage of all that we've got to offer. The other reason I was excited about when the, the team asked me just to welcome you folks is just um, this conference. And, you know, you've got a great agenda. You folks are doing amazing things. And, you know, as Craig mentioned in my bio, 36 years, you know, from IBM. So as you'd expect over this last year, I get a lot of questions from old colleagues and friends saying, wow, what is the difference in being on the private sector side for so long and then coming into the public sector? And really, there's, there's three things that, that stand out as I've worked with our, my colleagues here in the state of Tennessee. First is just you know, the, the passion that they have for the services that they provide for the folks in the state. Second is uh, we've got a budget challenge. I mean, revenue funding is not going up. Uh, and third, I'm more convinced than ever is that IT is the solution, you know, to what we're doing. And, you know, it's interesting, and I appreciate so much the vendors and the sponsors, but, you know, I was on that side also for many years. And, you know, within IBM, it was kind of like, uh, if you were general manager of the public sector or had a public sector territory, which I did at various times in my career, you know, you were kind of viewed as, well, that's kind of a tough deal. I mean, because you guys got tight budgets, you're always struggling with uh, just finding the right skills uh, because of what we have to pay. Uh, we know your procurement, you know, challenges. And by the way, our sales guys couldn't even take you to the lunch or the Super Bowl or the World Series because they couldn't get it paid for. So uh, I know the challenges that, that we all face, but I'm convinced that if we're going to make a difference in delivering the services in the states that we live in, with the passionate people that are our colleagues, we've got to do it through our information technology. There's no other solution to do more with less. So I guess my message here as I welcome you is stay the course. Uh, you folks are doing good things. Your citizens need you. And take advantage of all the great things that nasio has got set up for, for you this week. So again, welcome to Tennessee and stay the course. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Very much appreciate it. Um, these conferences don't happen by uh, 
sprinkling pixie dust and wishing good thoughts. They, they happen um, by a, a lot of folks putting a whole lot of time and effort and hours into it. And um, I'm always uh, been amazed. I've, I've been on the programs committee at my time in NASIO and, and the work that they do. The programs committee is chaired this year by um, our vice president, uh, Stu Davis, uh, CIO from the state of Ohio. And of course, Allison uh, and the staff do just uh, unbelievable work um, putting this together. So it is, um, it, it's always nice to see it come together. I'm gonna call Stu up to uh, give us an overview and conference highlights. Ladies and gentlemen, vice president, Stu Davis. So here we are. It's another year. David Bean, where are you? Come on forward, David. <clears throat> oh, look at that. He's wearing an Ohio State t-shirt today. There he comes. Come on, come on, come on. Got to hurry. So every year we have a little bit of a rivalry and a competition, as you can imagine, and being Ohio and Michigan CIO. Here are the ramifications of it right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, tweet that picture out today as we go forward. I think next year we're going to make it personal. I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and of course uh, David went to Eastern Michigan, so I think we're going to try a different route this way, see if we, one of the other of us can wear a different t-shirt next year. So good morning. I wanted to talk a little bit about the conference. As you know, as uh, Craig was kind enough to say, we, we broke all the records. This is about raising the bar and continuing our process and, and movement as we go forward. And I, I hate the word movement, it's more action because we are certainly action oriented. We have a lot of change that's gonna be happening and so that one of the themes of this is to embrace the change and react to the change and be proactive as much about the change and some of the things that you're gonna hear in the program today. So uh, the other part here is about collaboration. You know, we're all about collaboration and that starts with communication and coordination. And if we can get those three things working in concert with one another, they lead to the, the next piece. So you communicate, everybody understands what you have going on, you coordinate and you begin to work on things together and in concert with each other and then you collaborate and you really start to see the really good, thoughtful, innovative ideas that come out of that uh, through that process. Having roamed Nashville for the last couple of days, I understand now why it's called Nash Vegas. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things going on there. I got to listen to Tony Encinia from Pennsylvania sing the other night, which was always kind of fun. I'm sure there's more of that in store. So make sure you do get out and enjoy some of the city and, and some of the things that it has to offer. I also encourage you to use the mobile sites, which you can view the agenda and access the Sponsor Resource Center and view state CIO information. And that's a shout out to Cisco for the support of the mobile site. And if you haven't accessed the site, please go to nasio.org forward slash mobile and bookmark it because there will be a lot of good information on there. We also encourage you to tweet, like I said, like see that picture from uh, David. It's always a good one. Um, and th that will be on the big screen between general sessions and the member resource line. So if you have questions answered, discussion points recognized, put them out there and tweet at hashtag nasio 14 Make sure the member resource center located to the uh, registration is used so you can recharge your phone, your printers, your laptops. All those things are out there for your use and that's a shout out to Google for setting that up. We appreciate that very much. As Craig mentioned, we have an outstanding program and a really when you start to talk about collaboration, you can start that with a series of uh, opportunities we have on networking. So the beginning part of that is really the networking roundtables that we have this afternoon at three o'clock. That'll be in this room. The topics are located in the program. Make sure you go through there, make sure you participate. A lot of good things, a lot of good discussion come through those pieces. When you start to talk about the good things that the states are doing, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, their IT projects, IT uh, efforts programs, you know, I'm, I think somebody mentioned to me uh, that it's really looking at best practices, but really it's about plagiarism. So we share and share alike. We look at different approaches to things and uh, what works in our state and morph it to what would work in another state in your state. So make sure that you do that. And one of the great ways that we recognize all the good work that's going on in the states is through our award uh, program that we have here. So tomorrow morning, award 
Award recipients and finalists will be hosting breakfast roundtables at 7.30 in this room. It gives you the opportunity to see their applications and the things that they've been doing. Uh, during the annual conference, we'll present several awards, as you know. You won't want to miss the awards dinner tonight at 6. We'll recognize state IT award recipients and the Thomas M. Jarrett Scholarship recipients, which is all about cybersecurity, which is obviously becoming a bigger deal daily. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock, we'll also announce the state IT technology innovator re recipients. And Wednesday at 8.30, we'll present the Corporate Longevity Awards, which is probably longer than the state CIOs are here. So uh, when you start to talk about raising the bar, you know, we have some insightful general sessions today. Make sure you stick around. Make sure you, you listen to them because there's a lot of good ideas that will come through that and tee up action items that we all should be thinking about back in our own organizations or in our particular states, talking about big data, big data analytics, open data, review of the state CIO survey, which is always an important thing for us to be able to understand the things that we see coming up and marry that with the things that the corporate leadership uh, also sees as, as coming down our pike and working our alliances with the transforming public service from the inside out, which will be another session that we have later today. The program committee listened to what we had to say last year, and that's really how we came up with the breakout sessions. So make sure that you check into those. Those are all going to be real good. It's a great place to have direct interaction. And that would be the other thing that I would counsel to all of you. You know, don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Ask the questions. Get out there. Get engaged. And have some audience interaction where it's appropriate. And we'll move forward from there. You don't want to miss the closing keynote, so Army Ranger Kenny Thomas will come in and speak of his leadership in the heat of battle that he had in talking about the Mogadishu Mile and uh, that was really uh, articulated in Black Hawk Down, so should be a very interesting speaker. He'll be speaking tomorrow at 3.15 in this room. And finally, we have an exciting agenda lined up for Wednesday. The official launch of Cybersecurity Month will take place right here in this room. We have a great lineup of speakers and two panel sessions scheduled for the morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. So don't miss that event either because uh, cybersecurity, as I mentioned, is a, a big, big concern for all of us. And the more we can do as a, a group to protect the citizens' data and all of our corporate data in terms of a state, uh, you know, this is a pretty big deal. So we're proud to be able to launch that on Wednesday. And then finally, I want to encourage all of you to give back to the, to the Nashville community. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're hosting a Nashville Fun Walk Wednesday morning for those who donate. Also, if you do donate, you do receive a t-shirt. So these are in limited supply, but come get one, donate. It's a good cause. And if you sign up, that information table booth is right outside, out here in uh, level two, outside by the registration area. So now I would like to introduce Corey Johns, the Executive Director of Connected T Tennessee, and he'll give us an overview of the Computer for Kids program in Tennessee. And as Corey comes up, we'll tee up his video, please. My mom met my younger brother's um, father, and he was one of the reasons why I was removed from her home. Um, he was abusive verbally and physically towards me. During that time, while I was in high school, I ended up really sick with bacterial meningitis. My doctor, my PTP, is the one who reported the situation to social services, and that's how I ended up in foster care. Computers for Kids program is a program that Connected Tennessee launched in 2008 to place technology at the fingertips of disadvantaged youth. We think it's important for disadvantaged youth in Tennessee to have access to technology so that they can gain the digital literacy skills that will be important for them in their future, whether it's for education or for job opportunities. Receiving the laptop from Computers for Kids has really helped me tap into my college experience because when I first got here, everyone had a laptop, so it's helped me tap into my own college experience and feel like a college student. I actually met my sweet mate and we had the same laptop, so that's how we figured out that we were both in the same program. Ever since then, me and her have clicked and connected and we've shared life stories with each other and we know that we're not alone in this. Computers for Kids have been great and without that program, I don't know what we would do. One of the things that you do if you go to college, you've got to be able to keep up with the other kids. We don't have the resources to supply computers for everyone. So this is a great program that does that and gives our kids a level playing field. 
I started going to the Boys and Girls Club as a diversion on Saturdays. I was a football player and played for 14 years in the NFL. About 80% of the kids that the club serves are from non-traditional families. Many of our DCS kids, or our kids in foster care, also attend the Boys and Girls Club. When that box is handed to them, you see this look of accomplishment. I did this, I earned this. Uh, you can't buy that. You can't buy that look of fulfillment and accomplishment. And knowing that they accomplished the good grades or the diploma to earn a computer is as important as the computer itself. Since 2008, the Computers for Kids program has distributed over 5,050 computers to disadvantaged youth in Tennessee, uh, over 860 uh, to the Boys and Girls Clubs across the state, uh, about 3,500 to uh, directly to DCS foster youth who are graduating high school uh, and with good grades and good behavior. And we know that uh, those, those 5,050 computers uh, enabled over 90,000 documented hours of digital literacy training for those disadvantaged youth in 2012 alone. When I grow up, I want to be a criminal law judge, but I want to start by being a criminal lawyer. I think it's really imperative that people understand that if you don't help these kids at this point in their life, that they're probably not going to be successful. I don't think there's a better investment in our community than investment in children. Good morning. Well, welcome to Tennessee and welcome to the Music City. Uh, my name is Corey Johns. I'm executive director for Connected Tennessee, and I want to say thanks uh, to Stu, uh, uh, to the to the president, and and also and to the organization for selecting us this year as your Give Back Award recipient. Um, in complete confession, I almost put that tie on this morning before I realized that that video would be running. So tragedy averted. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, I would like to, obviously the video gave you a great sense, I hope, uh, about what the Computers for Kids program is, but if I, if I may for a moment, I'd like to talk to you just a moment about the, uh, the larger mission of Connected Tennessee. Connected Tennessee was launched in 2007 as our state broadband initiative at a time when Tennessee was recognized as a technology challenge state. Uh, since then, we've, we've come a long way. Um, some of the impacts we've seen to date include going from a place where technology access was, was challenging in rural and urban areas to an environment today where 82% of our households in the state can access broadband download speeds of 100 megabits per second or above. Uh, I know those, uh, a lot of times when I get to speak to groups and, and, and get in terms of me megabits and, and, and bits and bytes and gigabits and whatnot, it gets lost on a lot of folks, but I know among a group of, of state CIOs and, and uh, other information technology folks, you all have appreciation for that. You'll also have an appreciation for this. Our last statewide mapping update revealed that 8.79% of Tennessee households now have access to one gigabit speeds or above, making Tennessee a, a leader for uh, access to ultra high speed download. Along the way, we've also seen significant improvements in adoption. Uh, our first statewide adoption survey in 2007 revealed that less than half of Tennesseans, only 43%, subscribe to broadband internet at home. That was about four points behind the national average. Fortunately, we've been blessed to have led the national average by about two points for the last three years, and state broadband adoption had risen to 72% in late 2013. However, our work is not done. I should mention that Connected Tennessee is blessed to be one of the sister state programs in the Connected Nation family of state broadband initiatives. I know we have a diverse group of folks from across the country here, so I'll just note that we have sister state programs in Iowa, South Carolina, Nevada, Alaska, Minnesota, Texas, Michigan, Stu, and Ohio, and also in Puerto Rico. Um, I would encourage you to, if you're not already, get in touch with your state uh, Connected Nation affiliate uh, and, and also would be happy to connect you with those, if I may. I'd also like to comment on just a bit about where we're going moving forward. So we've seen some great uh, strides in terms of technology access and technology adoption increases. Uh, today, Connected Nations programs are squarely focused on increasing digital literacy. That includes our digital works program, which is 
which was born in Perry County, Tennessee, at a time when that county had the third highest unemployment in the nation, has since expanded into Ohio, and, and several other states are looking at that model as well. What it does is it provide, it takes unemployed and underemployed, mid-career adult workers primarily, who have low or no technology skills, provides them training and job placement into jobs that they, where they can telework and, and, and earn a sustainable, higher wage job, even living in a rural area. Connected Nations programs are also squarely focused on driving innovation in, edu in the education technology revolution. Uh, most notably, one of the successes on that front was the, the selection of Connected Nation to implement uh, the $100 million uh, pledge through the president's private sector driven Connect Ed initiative to bring the best in robust wireless individual devices and on and off campus connectivity for connecting with digital learning programs to 50,000 of our nation's school children to prove out the power and the potential of digital learning and information technology on student successes. Uh, we were pledged to, or we were proud to be selected for that portion of, of the implementation pledge to the effort by the AT&T Foundation. Last but certainly not least, Connected Tennessee's Computers for Kids program. You heard some of the facts and figures stated in the video that over 5,050 computers have been placed directly into the service of disadvantaged youth in Tennessee. Uh, 3,500 or more of those have gone directly to Department of Children's Service foster youth, so foster youth in state custody who were graduating high school with good grades and good behavior. We know that's made a significant impact on the lives of those students as well as the students who were able to access the, the computers that went into all 76 of our state's uh, boys and girls clubs across Tennessee. That, as stated, has, has documented over 90,000 hours of digital literacy training programs to the benefit of those young people in 2012 alone, leveraging programs like Kids College to help improve their core competencies in academic subject matter. We're very grateful to the state of Tennessee, the Department of Economic and Community Development, the Office for Information Resources for their early support and to the U.S. Department of Commerce and National Telecommunications and Information Administration for uh, a BTOP grant that continued to support the Computers for Kids program through the 2013 year. We're also grateful for NACIO to, for selecting us as a part of your give back program and hope that you will contribute to help us c continue to make an impact on the lives of these young people. Um, especially, I want to recognize state CIO Mark Bingle for his early, continual, and enduring support for the program. Uh, Computers for Kids, uh, truth be told, was, was Mark Bingle's brainchild, and uh, we are grateful to him for all of his support as well. And, and I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, what a great asset Tennessee has in, in, with Greg Adams serving as our state COO with the background he has in information technology and his understanding for the power that it can transform our workforce and our, our future for tomorrow. So I've heard that there is a, we have a record-breaking attendance here today and uh, excited to hear that. That's, that's great on a lot of different fronts. Um, and I hope that uh, I can ask you to join us and let's, let's set a new goal. Let's have a record-breaking donation as a part of the Give Back program. Uh, I know that there are not only some state CIOs and, and affiliates, but also some vendors in the room. I, I'm looking at the, uh, the calendar that was shown earlier and I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize that we're kind of at the end of the quarter here. So some of you may have you know, a little jingle left in some of those quarterly funds you're allowed and we'd be uh, grateful to in invite your support of this program. So I hope that you'll partner with us. Thank you so much uh, to NACIO and to Mr. Bingle and, and for you all for taking the time to come to Tennessee. I hope that you'll uh, help us out by helping ensure that the Computers for Kids program is able to make impacts on the lives of disadvantaged youth in Tennessee for many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Mark, for your continued leadership on many fronts. Um, we have a couple of new exciting additions uh, to the conference. We have a uh, daily Twitter contest, 
which I think should be um, pretty exciting. So there's going to be a lot of talk about hashtagging. I'm not imitating Jimmy Fallon. If I were to do that, it would be, you know, hashtag fried chicken, hashtag so great. Uh, I am, I'm still, I'm, it's going to be my theme. I'm stuck on the fried chicken picture. Uh, hashtag for the conference is uh, hashtag NASIO14. So we're trying to add some, some different flavor uh, for you throughout the day. Last night we had a Twitter picture contest at the hoedown. Uh, and of course we had our cowboy boot, um, uh, I guess, uh, contest. And we have a winner uh, from the great, great state of Alabama, Sherry Martin won the, uh, <laughs> it's official, we got the picture. Um, prizes can be picked up back at the registration booth uh, in the back. Um, today's contest is tweeting a quote from any one of today's session to win. If you, if you want to use, you know, hashtag fried chicken, you can, I'm not going to, I'm going to hold you that. Three winners are going to be chosen and announced tomorrow morning. Fun prizes, kind of keep it kind of fun and light throughout the day. Um, also, uh, another announcement, uh, we are now on Instagram. So I think we've uh, uh, jumped in uh, the deep end of the pool here at NASIO, uh, with social media. Um, uh, tag your, so I did a very brief video for one of our new staff members. And, I, and Allison told me, don't leave the back of the room. And, and, and uh, uh, Jessica said, it'll only take just 30 seconds. I said, there's no script? He said, no, we're just gonna like do a little video. It'll be online. I was like, okay, you know, it's, don't normally do it that way. Um, so our Instagram uh, photos, hashtag NASIO14 or, or directly to NASIO uh, to add more fun. You may have seen some of us walking around with a, a, a ribbon some of the ribbons are a little obnoxious, they get long, but uh, so they put sort of fun and creative ribbons on the bottom. Uh, last year we were, we were teasing each other um, about um, the ribbons. Mine says big cheese. Uh, it'll only say that for um, about um, eight or so more hours, in which case it's gonna be Craig Hu. Uh, you know, you're the past president now, really wanna talk to Stu. Um, it's gonna happen. So. Get, get into this ribbon thing, it's another way to contribute uh, and, and could be um, a whole lot of fun. Okay, how about uh, time for an ARS question before our keynote this morning. The question is, are you a country music fan? Yes, no, <laughs> or only when I'm in Nashville. It's going to be yes. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, so uh, we did hear about the, the Give Back program. So earlier slide uh, from this morning, if you recall, 31% of attendees here are new. So I would encourage you to uh, keep that program going and um, really be a part of that. Our Pinnacle sponsor uh, representative is uh, Mary Lou Provost of CA. Uh, she is the Senior Director for State, Local Government, and Education, focused on the western half of the Great Lakes region in the U.S. She's managed CA Technology State and Local Government practice for the past six years, and prior to that she held positions such as Clarity Solution Strategist, Enterprise Management Specialist, and Storage Management roles at CA and Sterling. She's got 16 years of experience working with public sector, and I would very much like you to join me in welcoming Mary Lou. Nothing like hearing your resume uh, out in front of everyone. <laughs> All right, well, on behalf of NASIO and CA Technologies, where business is rewritten by software that fuels transformation of government, enabling us to seize opportunities in this application economy. CA Technologies supports organizations from planning to development to management and security. CA is working with organizations worldwide to change the way we live, transact, and communicate. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker. After retiring at the zenith of her career in the Silicon Valley, our next speaker spent six years researching and writing. The book is titled The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of Collapse. When asked why the book has special significance, she claims every person wants to know 
why our government gets more in debt, our air and water more polluted, our jails more crowded, and our security more tenuous. We appear to have lost our ability to solve our problems. The watchman's rattle offers a genetic explanation for the paralysis and prescribes a way out. The success of her first book has led to a nationally syndicated radio program called The Costa Report. I'm told it's um, on over 5,000 different stations and has a following of about 3.5 million people. The former, she is the former CEO and founder of one of the largest marketing firms in Silicon Valley. She developed an extensive track record introducing new technology for a number of very large IT firms, some of which are in this room. Um, her talk will not leave enough time for questions, so feel free to find her on the right side of the stage after the session. With that, I'd like to offer a wonderful welcome to Rebecca Costa. Good morning. Can you uh, hear me? I had him put a, a lavalier on me because I'm Italian and I have to uh, move my hands and walk or I turn mute. Um, uh, I am so uh, excited to address you uh, this morning. Uh, I think the reason that they brought me on board as a speaker is I may be the only person in the United States who's talking about the intersection between technology, public policy, and basic human biology. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to tackle the difficult subject of complexity and chaos. I don't know, are there, is there anyone, I know it's the wrong demographic, is there anybody that follows the HBO series Game of Thrones? Oh good, okay. So you're going to appreciate this. Uh, there is a point at which one of the protagonists is observing uh, an oncoming war. And, and he, he uses a wonderful phrase. He says, chaos is a pit or a ladder. It's a pit or it's a ladder. And I got to thinking about this and I thought, well, it feels like a pit when you're on the first rung of the ladder. Doesn't feel like you're really climbing out of the pit. But what we're gonna talk about today is we're going to talk about how to climb out from what is a chaotic pit. And, and to be honest, we're all sort of living that reality. If you're in the IT CIO space, you live this day in and day out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this the old-fashioned way because I didn't know we had clickers. So I'm going <laughs> to do this the old-fashioned way. Uh, would you raise your hand if you noticed, let's just say in the last five years, that things have gotten much more complicated, significantly more complicated? Okay, keep your hands up. I want you to look across the room. It's not you. That, that, that's the first place we have to start. Uh, for a while, my son, who's in his 30s, he, he had me convinced it was an age thing. He said, you know, you're getting older, Mom, and, you know, that's what really happens when you get older. You can't really manage change very well. And then we happened to get into an elevator, and there was an 18-year-old girl, and she had a, a new... Uh, I don't know, some new handheld device, and she nudged him, and she said, do you know how to turn the music off on this? And I said, I don't think this is an age thing. I think we're all going through it. The fact is, is that complexity, we're manufacturing it in picoseconds, and we're making new discoveries every minute of every day. According to Eric Schmidt, every uh, you know, 48 hours or so, we're in inventing the entire universe of data from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. That means you go to bed on Friday night, Monday morning, that entire universe of data has been replicated. Um, so the fact is, is that we're operating on a very small subset of information at any particular point in time, and as data production increases, that subset is even getting smaller. So my interest was, well, what happens? Now, does anybody know what this slide is? This slide was the slide that General McChrystal put in front of the American people and said, when we understand this, we win the campaign in Afghanistan. I happened to be in the press room, and, and it was interesting, all the media put their pens down and said, oh no, we're just, just, you know, are you kidding me? Can I get a copy of it so I could try to find the arrows? This is the uh, Obama uh, um, uh, Affordable Care Act. This is how you process uh, a uh, request from the uh, 
uh, Affordable Care Act. This is the current immigration roadmap. I mean, we're all laughing, but you know, I have to look a long time to find a chart that fits on one page, isn't uh, multiple page. This is uh, how you acquire anything from the Defense Department. For all of you vendors, I have these available for you if you want to take them back. Um, and, and, you know, I don't need to go through this, uh, the, the long list, this is a partial list, of the kinds of changes that everyone in the CTO and the CIO uh, spaces is, uh, is experiencing right now. But, but to sum it all up, fast change means big risk. And that's some of what we're going to talk about here in the next minute. You've all heard the four V's by now over and over again. The velocity of data that's coming at us is overwhelming. It is impossible without technology to process the information. The whole universe of information every 48 hours, it's, it's impossible. The volume, the variety from unstructured to structured data. Many of you are dealing only in the structured data world today. Be honest about it. But according to IBM, as much as 80 or 90% of the data that you should be paying attention to is unstructured. And unstructured in, in the normal world means unmanageable. <laughs> it really does. We don't really know what to do with unstructured data. And then the veracity. For every one report that you see uh, on the internet, you can find five that directly contradict it. Let's be honest about it. So are we dealing with the data wild west? I mean, on average, you've got this turnover going on about every 30, 32 months of the people who are charged with building out the infrastructure that will determine the ability to deliver on the promise of public policy. And with that kind of turnover, you know, we were having a side conversation. I wasn't going to talk about this, but any governor who replaces a CIO or CTO shouldn't be voted in. I'm sorry. I don't think they should because I know too much about how long it takes to build out that infrastructure. And you've got to, quote, stay the course. You must stay the course. And so this isn't a political issue. Let's be honest about it. Technology has got nothing to do with politics. Can we at least be honest about that? Now, don't throw me off the stage here. I know I, got, I, know I went rogue on you. But let's at least in this room be honest that technology has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with the delivery of public policy. Uh, but biological change, and this is where technology, public policy, and basic human biology begin to intersect. Biological change takes millions of years. So my interest and my field of study happens to be a very particular uh, field of study. What happens when complexity races ahead of our brain's ability to understand it? Well, we become gridlocked. We know what our most dangerous threats are. We can describe them in great detail. We have lots of meetings about them, but we can't take action. We become unable to fix our problems, and we begin passing them from one generation, one administration, to another as they worsen. They begin to exponentiate. Now, one thing the human brain does not do very well right now at this particular point in time is understand exponentiation. So we, unfortunately, always think we have more time. And suddenly, we're upon a fiscal cliff. By the way, uh, Paul O'Neill, who was the head of the Treasury Department about 12 years ago, under the Bush administration, wrote a, uh, wrote a paper and said, we're going we're gonna to hit some kind of major problem budget-wise, and the government will likely have to close down. 12 years, 12, 13 years ago, he wrote this paper. He put it out to the public. But he didn't use the word fiscal cliff, so the danger wasn't quite near term enough. Right? But suddenly, when it, when, when it was uh, described as fiscal cliff, we all got our act together really, really fast. So, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment as well. Every organization and civilization reaches a cognitive threshold. And why does this occur? Well, it's pretty obvious. There's the rapid pace of progress that begins to expo exponentiate and move quicker and quicker and quicker. 
and then the very slow pace of human evolution. Right now, in my car, I need 14 appendages to use my nav system, drive, drink my coffee, plug my iPod in. You know, I, I, I need more appendages than I have. I'm not going to get them for hundreds of millions of years. In fact, I would argue that we are so disconnected from the limits of the human organism that they had to make a law to tell me I can't text and drive a two-ton vehicle, really? Okay, so for all the people who say, well, we don't want government involved in every aspect of our lives, how much soda we can drink, and whether we can text and drive, well, you know, if we can't figure out what the human organism is capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing, well, I guess the government's going to have to do it for us, right? So when I get into some of these organizations and they say, well, I don't want the government in my business, I'm going, well, you couldn't figure out, you couldn't text and drive. Okay, we're kind of disconnected from biological limitations. This uneven rate of change between biology and complexity causes a gap to occur, and it has caused this gap throughout human history. This is nothing new. We just happen, we in this room, happen to be living in the messy period. And I think the, that's the right word, messy. It's kind of messy right now. Now, a lot of you forgot about how mankind sort of evolved all of these capabilities over time. Uh, the last evolutionary milestone that we experienced occurred when we stood upright. Now, this is important because when we stood upright, we could suddenly see our enemies and smell our enemies, but we had no ability in our brains to know what to do. I mean, it, it, there's, it's one thing to see danger coming. It's another thing not to have the prefrontal cortex. So during that period of time, if you go into natural history museums, you see that cavemen, that, that their, uh, their, their frontal brow gets larger and larger and larger, and that's to accommodate the CEO of your brain. This is going to be important a little later on to remember, because that CEO processes information and makes logical and rational decisions. And when organizations are young, our problems are kind of simpler. Early, the earliest stages of society, our problems are simple and they're easily managed by the left and the right brain and the kind of skill sets that we've evolved to this point in time. But as we've all, all of you put your hands up when I asked you how complicated things have gotten in just the last five years, well, as these problems become larger and more unwieldy and more multi-layered and dynamically changing, they start to look like the kinds of problems that physicists deal with every day, where one variable changes 0.00001% and all the other millions of variables change simultaneously. That's the environment. So what is the definition of complexity? I say messy. It's messy. But there's actually a better definition. And by the way, let me save you all some time. Don't ever buy any books on complexity because they'll make your head want to explode. They're too com all the books on complexity are too complex. So I use a very simple definition of complexity. It comes out of Harvard University, and it's the fact that there are simply more wrong choices than there are right ones. And the number of wrong ones are exponentiating. So we enter a complex environment, one way to think of it, is a high failure rate environment. It means the number of failures are going to necessarily uh, outweigh the number of successes. So when you're picking a vendor, you're picking a technological course, you're picking a particular piece of equipment, you're hiring a particular expert or consultant, your odds of being wrong are much larger than being right. And they're getting worse as things get more complex. Are y'all depressed now? <laughs> yeah, OK, it gets better. It gets better. This is why we saw the Affordable Care Act website go down. It was complicated beyond anyone's ex experience. And this is not a political issue. This was not, oh, Obama didn't know what he was doing. He was a bad taskmaster. 
This was, it, it was inevitable that something as complicated as this was likely to have a failure rate. Now, I was asked about this by Juan Williams at a, a, at a conference at Sun Life uh, re, uh, not too long ago, and he said, what went wrong? And I said, well, in Silicon Valley, we alpha, beta, and theta test things before we release them into the public. That's why you get version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, because 2.0 has all the things that didn't work in 1.0. We, we do know this, right? Yeah, if we got it all right, we wouldn't have to have 2.0 and 3.0 and so on and so forth. But we have to debug things, and so we can only release a subset of what we, what we plan to, to release. But when you think about how complexity is, is exponentiating, we've gone from a tax code of 504 pages to 75,000 pages. It changed in the time I made this slide. I have asked people, I've gone throughout the world, and I've asked, and you all have credit cards, I've asked people, um, you know, uh, how many of you read your credit card contracts? It's 20,000 words. Has anybody in this room ever read from beginning to end your credit card contract? Oh my God, this is the first time. This is the first time I've ever had anyone say yes. I have never read them. I own four credit cards and I'm legally liable <laughs> to those companies and I admit I've never read them. And what's more annoying is every quarter they send me a little pamphlet that says these are the change to your terms. Are you kidding me? I haven't read the original terms. There's a million apps in the Apple Store, 900,000 Facebook uh, users, and there are somewhere in the neighborhood of about, uh, I think it's about 180 items on the Cheesecake Factory menu. I count everything. People don't like to take me anywhere. It's like, hey, let's just count these. Complexity makes facts and knowledge very difficult to acquire. Whereas five years ago, we might have been looking for a needle in the haystack, and that was daunting enough for the CIOs and CTOs in the room. We're now looking for a specific needle in a stack of needles. That's our situation right now. So when complexity makes knowledge difficult to attain, we are designed as human beings to just flip a switch. We switch over to beliefs. You've heard the term hippo, highest paid person's opinion in the room? Works for me. Let that guy decide, right? Or somebody feels very passionate about it, we move in that direction. We have uh, beliefs about a lot of things. Uh, Dr. Oz says raspberry ketones will help you lose 10 pounds, and you can't stock enough raspberry ketones in any store. We're, we make a mad rush down there, because who doesn't want to lose 10 pounds? Everybody. We have beliefs about climate change. We have 1.5 billion readings of the Earth's surface temperature, and 65% of the people in the United States do not believe climate change exists. It, I guess we need 2 billion or what? I mean, there's some threshold, we just haven't hit it yet. Stem cell research, nuclear power, wars. What is a belief? I'm not talking about religious beliefs. I'm, I'm talking about you have lots of beliefs. Beliefs are not wrong. I want to create a new category for you. If something cannot be proven empirically, it's simply unproven. It doesn't make it wrong. We live in a time when, when you can't prove something with empirical data, people rush to say it's wrong. It's not wrong, it's unproven. We have a lot of things that are unproven, and we need to learn to live in that ambiguous space. Most of the world, as a scientist, I can tell you, is ambiguous, it's gray, it's not black and white. The wonderful thing about a belief is it's cognitively inexpensive. To prove something scientifically is a rigorous and very taxing and long-term process. To believe something, I just say, I believe it. I don't believe it, we're done, all done. And we have beliefs that are large and small. When you, go to, when you see a signal change, you go to cross the street, you believe it's safe to cross. You don't stand there and watch every single car come to a stop. Now, one of the things that we've discovered is the human organism requires both beliefs and knowledge. But sometimes we don't let empirical data get in the way. Bloodletting, we practiced it for 200 years in spite of the fact all the patients were dying in front of us. But we are a stubborn little creature. Once we grab onto a belief, we don't like to let it go. And, and, and by the way, I have lots of friends that are scientists and, and you know, left brain thinkers, and they say to me, oh, we don't really subscribe to beliefs. And I said, well, listen, every scientific theory started out as a hypothesis. What do you call a hypothesis? What do you call a theory? It's a belief, and now you're going to go collect empirical data to support it. Until that point, it's unproven. 
We've discovered that civilizations and organizations, when they're thriving, there is an accommodation for both beliefs and also an accommodation for uh, empirical factual data. But over time, as complexity begins to grow and systems become unwieldy and data cannot be determined uh, to be true or false, beliefs begin to dominate and we become susceptible to unproven claims. Does anybody know who the guy on the right-hand side is? Bernie Madoff. By the way, the people who handed over their money to Bernie Madoff, they weren't unsophisticated investors. These were people that had been in the market for years and years and years, people like Steven Spielberg. Why would they hand over tens of millions of dollars to Bernie Madoff? Very easy. He said, it's too complicated. What I do is too complicated, right? All you need to worry about is, do I give you a return? And so we become very susceptible to false leaders who will make the decision and the analysis for us. And over time, and this is the danger sign, decisions and policies begin to be shaped by unproven beliefs and false prophets. This is the social consequence of complexity. Now, whenever I use a modern day example, I've noticed that we've become so polarized in this country that whenever I use any example at all, they say, oh, she's on the left, she's on the right. So I can't use any current examples. <laughs> uh, I have to go back many thousands of years to the Mayan society. I think it's kind of safe to use them as an example at this point in time. So we're about three, I want to I wanna show you how these principles play out so that you can map them on, on your situations in your states and also uh, with what's going on in the world today. For 3,000 years, the Mayans knew they had a very tenuous relationship with rainfall. They knew they needed the water for their societies to grow. And if they didn't have water, that would be the end of the Mayan empire. So many people go down uh, to see the Mayan ruins. They want to go see the great Mayan temples. But I will tell you that the Mayans were phenomenal hydraulic engineers, masters for their time. They built reservoirs that were unprecedented. They dug out underground cisterns so that the water would not evaporate. And they developed the first uh, refrigeration units. When, when there were food scarcities during times of uh, low rainfall, they stored the food in these underground cisterns where it was cool and moist and the food would not spoil. They practiced crop rotation, water conservation. They had an amazing public policy toward water. They also simultaneously practiced fetishism. They were sacrificing captured slaves to make the gods happy so the rains would come. These, both these things were done in tandem during the first 2,000 years of the Mayan reign. But as the drought began to increase, you see that they begin to build no more reservoirs. There's no more digging of underground cisterns, no more crop rotation. No more water conservation. They begin to make a turn toward irrational public policy. At first, they increase the number of sacrifices of captured enemy slaves. Then they move on to young virgins. The water doesn't come. The rain doesn't come. Then they move on to the old and the infirm inside their, inside their tribes. And just prior to the Mayan collapse, you see hundreds and hundreds of years of no man-made remedies, but only an escalation of sacrifice. At the very end, prior to the collapse, they are, uh, they are murdering newborn, unspoiled infants as a, as a remedy to their, to their problems. Now, many people say to me, well, Rebecca, we're not doing that. No, we have people on the earth who believe that flying a plane into a building is a remedy for their problems. As a scientist, I will tell you that it's not much different. We're behaving like the Mayans. We're in this cycle. And the first sign that complexity is outpacing our cognitive capabilities as a human being is that we become gridlocked. We know what the problems are. We can't get on top of them. We can't get consensus. We can't get agreement. We can't get that word movement. The second is that there's a massive confusion in the society and amongst leaders between beliefs and actual knowledge, empirical knowledge. And the third is that public policy begins to be based on beliefs. 
and then collapse ensues. The conditions for collapse uh, begin, to, begin to appear in every society. We can go back to the Romans, we can go back to the Khmer Empire. In my book, I cover many, many civilizations because that's what took the six years of writing it, was to go back and see, is there a pattern? Because the collapse isn't interesting. It's not. When you're already at the fiscal cliff, it's too late. It's the road signs as you're traveling toward that cliff that are fundamentally much more interesting because they allow us the opportunity to turn away. And that is who you are. That's what you're responsible for. You are at the vanguard of change. Your hands are on that steering wheel. You can turn society away from that cliff, but only if we understand what the dynamics are and what the solutions are. Ed Wilson says that we live in a time when we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And he, and he says this with a big smile on his face, and he says, are you wondering why we have the conditions we have? It's very easy to understand. Now, a cognitive threshold is not the only biological obstacle that we face. One of the things that we have to remember is that we are not born blank slates. We were told many, many years ago that you were a blank slate and your teacher wrote on your slate and your, and your friends wrote on your slate and then eventually that's who you became. But we forgot our inheritance, our genetic inheritance. Now, not too long ago, I use myself as a guinea pig, by the way, for all the things I'm talking to you about. Not too long ago, I, I was wondering why I do the things I do that are completely irrational. Uh, I have struggled with a weight problem all my life. If you've got a buffet out and you've got some healthy choices, carrot sticks, celery, and you've got some glazed donuts over there, get out of my way. My hand's going for the glazed donut. And I know I should never eat another donut the rest of my life. There's nothing, no reason to eat a donut. But I want them. I want them. Oh, do I want them. Actually, I was speaking at another location about six months ago and delivered to my hotel room after my speech was a giant box of donuts. And I said, no, I, I couldn't, couldn't find the, the maids quickly enough to give them away and get them out of my room because I'm not that strong of a person. And I got to thinking about this and I actually talked to Oprah about this because she seems to have the same issue. You know, we both have the, you know, we have the fat us, the thin us, the fat us, the thin us. And I realized that I am the descendant of tribes that were very, very good at identifying high calories. And in earlier times, that was a massive advantage, by the way, because in times of food shortage, those organisms of my tribe that ate those healthy carrots and celery, their DNA is not in the room. <laughs> I made it. They didn't. So what's happened is, is that, the, the, that the environment has changed. I've also made another discovery about my ancestors. My ancestors were really good at staying still and not moving around unless they needed to find more donuts right. or, or fight off a predator. And it turns out I'm not the only one, right? We all do. We all have kind of crazy behaviors that we can't explain. But we never make any accommodation for how that plays out in the workplace. I had a CEO of a major Fortune 500 company come up to me after one of my presentations and he said, Rebecca, you're, you're very fun, you're very smart, but I don't have any of those situations. I, I don't, I'm a very rational guy. I make my decisions based on data. And I thought about it. I thought, huh, what could I say to him? And I came up with something that was pretty cool. I, I said to him, do you ever go grocery shopping? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, let me, let me ask you to do me. Can you do a little experiment for me, just for fun? And he said, sure, sure, well, what is it? And I said, I want to save you a lot of time and trouble. I don't want you going up and down the aisle having to look for everything that you want, bread, milk, cereal. I said, what I want you to do is get your cart, I want you to go straight to the checkout line, and all those people that are lined up to pay for their stuff, just uh, take the stuff out of their baskets. They got everything you need. He said, what? I said, shop out of their baskets. He looked at me and says, I'm not going to do that. And I said, why? They haven't paid for it. It's not theirs. 
They're in line to go pay for it. It belongs to the store. And, he's, and, I, and I said, what do you suppose would happen? He said, well, there, there'd be a fist fight. They'd call the manager. I said, what's the manager going to do? You're not stealing. They haven't paid for it. it and I said, why do you suppose a fist fight would erupt? Why do you suppose chaos would ensue? And he said, I don't know why, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to shop out of other people's carts. I said, people are funny about their grocery carts. If you even go over to someone's and accidentally push it, they go, hey, 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 that's my cart. No, no, it's not. It's the store's cart, and the stuff in it is, doesn't belong to you. <laughs> now, you try that out. But get your boxing gloves ready, OK? But in earlier times, a territory marked our, the th had the things that we needed to survive. And today, sometimes that territory is my job. Sometimes it's my state. It has the things I feel are vital to my survival, my family's survival, my troop. And when you're in a grocery store, the cart is your territory. And you better not come in it, because even the most peaceful bonobo monkeys will attack if you in, in, intrude on their territories. What other genetic predispositions get in our way of progress, of movement? Well, one of them is a real problem for us as human beings. We're struggling with this right now. And that is that you are wired today, at this point in time, only to respond to short-term danger. If I go in here and I take a snake out and I throw it out into the middle of the room, you'll be tripping all over yourselves to get out of the way. That's what, because your body will fill with chemicals and you go into fight and flight. But when we put a cuff on people and we stick them in a lab and we show them global burning, not global warming, global burning, or we show them what's going to happen to the, the federal deficit, their heartbeat does not go up one beat per hour. So you have no physiological response to long-term danger. So when people come to me and they say, how do we get our organizations to take action? How do we get them to move on these initiatives? How do we move faster? I say to them, if you don't make it a snake, you don't have any physiological response. Now, I'm not a fear monger. Don't make everything a snake. Or after, after a while, we become desensitized to snakes. That's not the direction you want to go in. But planning suffers because there is human biology. There is no human reaction to long-term threat. Now, some of you are preemptors in this room. I know this because of the positions that you hold in the, comp in, in the states that you're in. Some of you are preemptors. Some of you see what's coming, and you want to preempt that danger because it's small now. It's the size of a snowball in your hand, and you know it's going to be a snowball the size of a building. And you're wondering, how do I get others to see the urgency? Well, there are ways. There are ways to do that. We'll go through some of those in just a moment. So how do we break the cycle? Can we really innovate our way out of a repetitive pattern of collapse? This was the question I posed to myself before I wrote my book. Because otherwise, I was writing a book on gloom and doom. And you could tell I'm kind of a sunny personality. I'm, I'm an optimist, and I'm, I'm a happy person. So I didn't really want to write that book, so I had to go looking. And what I discovered was the age-old principles of adaptation. Meganson says that it's not the strongest of us that'll survive. It's not even the smartest of us. But it's the organizations and the individuals that adapt quickly. Fast adaptation is all we have. Now, given that, the, the cat's out of the bag. We've broken down the human genome, and we have discovered, sadly, that we only have less than a 5% difference from a bonobo monkey to work with. But that 5% is blessed. That's the word I want to use. That 5% is a gift. Because that 5% is our ability to reason. No other living organism understands tomorrow. You ever thought about that? They don't understand the concept of tomorrow, let alone a week, let alone a month, a year, five years down the road. And so the highest instrument that we in this room have inherited over millions of years of ancestors is our ability to preview what is coming and then take an action in the present 
to circumvent or minimize an event that hasn't occurred. If that isn't the greatest survival advantage that's ever been invented, I don't know what is. You can, you can get rid of a danger before it happened. No creature, no living creature has ever had that. So the question is whether we call upon the higher instruments of our genetic inheritance or we fall to the lowest, those we share in common with the lower animals. This is the choice we must make. This is why it's messy. We are choosing between higher genetic instruments and lower genetic instruments. So now let's talk about fast adaptation. How do we do it? Well, we have strategic and technology. We have strategy and technology. They got to go hand in hand. And we also have physical adaptation. Now, I'm going to roll through this pretty fast. But as you heard, I'm going to be staying here afterwards for Q&A. And I'll stay as long as you need. We could drill down to some of the specific issues that you may have. Because I'm going to roll through this pretty, pretty quickly. Over time, if there are a number, if complexity is more bad choices than good choices, more incorrect choices than correct choices, if that's really the definition of complexity, over time we're becoming bad pickers. And, and as time goes by, we're running the clock out. Now, I won't go through the Gulf oil spill and how we handled or mishandled that particular situation, except for to say that. We initially thought we could drop a concrete box on the hole. When you, you remember seeing all of these Hiroshima-looking clouds of oil come up to the top of the water. We thought that we would put a, a, a concrete box on it, and that would take care of it. And then 30 days later, we said no. And then we decided we were going to drill in the bottom and take some of the oil before it reached the surface. That didn't really work. And the third solution was static kill. And that worked, and it's held. But when we're looking at overwhelming complex situations that are time sensitive and mission critical, we can't really solve those in a linear fashion. We need a different model. And thankfully, we have models that are very successful in high failure rate environments. We just don't apply them to solutions. We apply them to investments. So the, uh, the model that I like to use is venture capital. For every 100 companies that venture capitalists do spectacular due diligence on, they're only expecting maybe 10 or 15 to do well. Recently, I interviewed AJ Kubani, who's the founder of uh, the you know, As Seen on TV brands, and it's much worse for him. He looks at 10,000 prospective products, 1,000 he does due diligence on, 100 he tests markets, and 10, he, 10 qualify for As Seen on TV. But he's a billionaire. He just bought a $34 million condo in, in, uh, in Miami, I think it is. So he talk about a high failure rate, 10 out of 10,000. Know, but he understands what a high failure rate environment is. The rescue of the Chilean miners, you might remember that. At the time, it was no different than the Gulf oil spill. Time sensitive, mission critical problem disastrous consequences if they didn't get those miners out. What did they do? They knew due diligence would not allow them to narrow down the one plan that would work. It was impossible. So they launched 16 plans in tandem. Anybody who had a plan that even remotely looked like it would work. And they marched down, and then 16 turned into 15. 15 turned into 14. Because as empirical data was coming in, they were realizing that plan won't work, that plan won't work. And when they rescued every single Chilean miner, they were still evoking two or three plans. The plan that worked happened to work because someone had the wisdom to consult a miner who had been working, uh, or a uh, uh, geologist who had been working the site for 35 years. They came to him and they said, could you just look over these plans? And he said, I would just adjust about 1% for settling. I do that when we drill. Whenever you smart people from the university come here and give me your plans, I always adjust for the settling. And as a result, they got every miner out. I want to remind us, and I don't need to remind us, because we just experienced this at the Chicago airport. Everybody knows what has recently happened there. Because of budget restraints, there is tremendous pressure right, to consolidate and get down to single systems. But in nature, 
Any drive toward singularity is a drive toward extinction. You find a species that will only eat one animal or one plant, they're on their way out. And there is a lot of confusion, it seems to me, and I think that, you know, there's a whole nother speech I give on the difference between waste and necessary redundancy. Just because you haven't used something for a long time, let's not confuse it with, with not being necessary redundancy. We just found that out in Chicago the hard way. It costs a lot more money to look at things that way. When I was asked about the euro, I said it's a terrible idea. All that will happen is as soon as one country misreports, all of them will begin to go down. Consolidation sounds, efficiency sounds like a good idea. But the amount of risks that you take on doesn't look very risky because it's cataclysmic and it comes all at once. And it's over long, long periods of time. So you might get away with it for a while, but then suddenly you've got one fiber cable running all of Chicago airport and 4,000 flights a day being canceled. So here's where technology comes to the rescue. We have five categories of technology, and I'm going to roll through these pretty fast. Analysis, big data analytics, but we got to combine that with data visualization that makes the data consumable to us. Mobility and access, mobile apps, cloud computing, and social media. Content, bigger data is on the way. Facial recognition software, nanobots, 3D printing, surveillance, drones, holograms. These are not on your radar and you are not moving toward deploying those new technologies, you're already late to the table. Cybersecurity, you're going to hear more about that later, and neuroscience. Neuroscience ought to be part of everybody's uh, uh, agenda in every state. So let's start with analysis. Big data analytics, what is it? Well, big data can go and search the entire universe of structured and unstructured data and bring back to us just the information that we need. Remember we were saying we're looking for a needle in, the, in, a, in a, a, a stack of needles? That's what big data analytics does. It's only going to bring back the data that we need across that huge universe of information. Uh, the big data application I will tell you about that I had a chance to witness is at the, in the ER of a hospital. A patient rolls in, all the information that is known about that stranger, that patient, is put into a Watson type of system, and Watson comes back and says, it is 64% that the patient has this, 29% they have this, 26% that they have this. However, and this is where I think big data really pays off, analytics pays off, it goes to the person who has checked you in and says, but if you got me this data next, my diagnosis would improve 73%. So instead of when you arrive at the ER, you're taking a bet as to the smartest, most capable person in the hospital is going to take you in and make a diagnosis, or the least capable person, and that's going to determine whether you live or die. Instead of that happening, now the, the, the playing field is level. It's not based on my experience or my education, because I can put in the symptoms that are known, and Watson will search the universe of medical data, come back, give me the probabilities, and more importantly, give me a pointer as to where I want to go. This will help in the skilled labor shortage. This it, Big data analytics has payoffs beyond being able to get to a solution that's empirically based quick enough that you can take an action. It's also going to change the labor market very dramatically. Data visualization. You can give me all the data in the world, but if it's 18 pages of spreadsheets, no, that's not happening anymore. I need data I can react to. And that means looking at people like Tableau Software, as an example where they will take massively complex data and reduce it down to a chart, a graph, a bunch of bars, something that I can take action on. In terms of mobility and access, you know that if you don't tie a big data system into a mobile app, you really don't have anything. Because everybody can't be at their desk and everybody can't have access within the company. You need it outside the company. To give you an example of big data and how 
it, it, tied to a mobile app, it completely revolutionizes agriculture. And I'm going to talk about a lot of revolutionary concepts here in the remaining time. When I was hired to work with Dole Fresh Foods as a consultant, I spent three months listening. They're the largest food producer in the world. I spent three months going around the world, looking at all their agricultural production areas, listening to what kinds of issues they had. And when I came back, I said, I need to change the vocabulary inside of Dole. And they said, OK, what do you have in mind? And I said, you're actually running an emergency room. When you cut a head of lettuce, it is a patient that is dying. Now we need to get that dying patient to the grocery store before they're brown and dead. You have the same problem as an ER. And they said, what are you talking about? And I said, it's the same model. And data analytics used in an ER. And I said, so I want all the executives to go and meet your, your friends in hospital administration right now. Go down and find out what procedures and what they're using in an ER. And then we have to go around and educate everyone. And they said, OK, how are we going to do that? So in, within Dole, they began to adopt emergency room procedures to get produce, which is dying, to the store. It's the same problem. You might not look at it that way, but it is. But more importantly, as they began to do these da big data analytics, more importantly, what was fascinating is that they were able to give an app to a farmer who was growing produce on a hillside in Venezuela, right? And he can now plug in and say, I had a 2% humidity change at the top of my hill. What should I do? And Dole can come back and say, start a 1% calcium drip, and your fruit won't be too soft, and we'll, you'll still get a high yield. That information is available on a mobile phone to anybody that's a dole grower around the world. I won't get in much into social media because I know there's some breakout sessions about that, and I also know that there'll be people that are covering cloud computing that are making, that are democratizing data within companies and organizations. Again, cloud computing to me smacks of singularity. And where there's singularity, you have cybersecurity issues. I crack into the cloud, can I get to everything? It's something that I think everybody's struggling with. Let's talk about content creation. I just came back from a, uh, a conference where they had facial recognition software on every single attendee, and they were giving, and it was very annoying, they were giving feedback to the speakers, people are tuning out. They're excited, they're not excited, because we express pain and pleasure through our faces. So this was being used in a hospital. Uh, they had a camera on a patient who had just come out of surgery, and it was wired to a nurse's station. And, uh, and as the patient was waking up, remember, pain and pleasure through your face, as the patient was waking up and they started to exhibit slight amounts of discomfort, the nurse's station was rung, and the nurse appeared with pain medication before the patient started madly ringing the buzzer. So uh, facial recognition software is going to play a big role in education. It will give automatic feedback to teachers that their students either learned the content or didn't. They're falling asleep on you, whatever. Very, very important. Nanobots. If nanobots are not on your radar now, they should be. They're going to completely revolutionize uh, healthcare. The first nanobot that is the size of a human cell is now in trials. It was injected into a Norwegian rat. It was programmed to eliminate the cancer cells within the Norwegian rat, and it eliminated them. And then it was expunged. Smaller than the size of a human cell. Medicine as we know it, we're not going to be taking pharmaceuticals. Radiation treatment, no. Nanobots will be injected into your body and they'll be programmed to eliminate the plaque for Alzheimer's. Nanobots currently are, are, stayed, are getting ready to replace pesticides in agricultural growth. They'll be injected into a plant. They'll be sprayed. They'll crawl into a plant and they will report how much water that individual plant in the field needs. 
and what vitamin deficiencies it, ha it needs. And the nanobot will administer those so that you'll get the maximum productivity from every single plant in the field. 3D printing. You've all seen the, probably the video of the guy up in Canada who used a 3D printer and a few hours later had a plastic gun that will shoot five bullets. I recently had a chance to, I was in Washington, D.C., and I said, so um, the gun control laws, how, how do we handle 3D printers that can print guns and rubber bullets? And they said, well, we're not there yet. <laughs> we're catching up to you. Well, it's, it's already happening. Are you, are you going to outlaw the downloading of schematics? And how is that going to play into, the, into free speech? These are issues that we're coming up against. Surveillance, how much, how far? Uh, I was just recently at a conference where there's drones the size of little dragonflies, and they were flying throughout the conference. And they were picking up unstructured data. Uh, so when you leave this room, in case they have them, everybody say you loved the presentation because they scored on based on what people were talking about and what the buzz, uh, what the buzz is. Uh, Pepsi actually did a demonstration. They're using drones throughout their warehouses now uh, to do all of the inventory control and management as well. I also had an opportunity to see a hologram, which I would have sworn was a, a live speaker. It only lasted about five minutes, but they were up on a stage like this. And the only reason we knew that they weren't, they weren't the real speaker was all of a sudden they disappeared like a magic app. And the whole room just, you know, groaned because we, we had all been tricked. So soon, nurses, holographic nurses will be appearing in hospitals. Teachers may be holographic and be exported as well because we do like that, that human contact. Cybersecurity, I'm going to skip over because you've got some sessions on that later. I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to have to run through the golden age of neuroscience. We live in the golden age of neuroscience. Prior to this point, we had left brain thinking and right brain th thinking. Left brains make a decision by starting out with this many options and then narrowing down, narrowing down until one or two options, and then you pick. That's it. The right side of your brain uses synthesis. You're talking to me, and you have a little bit of perspiration above your lip, and I know you're lying to me. By the way, you're all excellent liar detectors. Uh, you had to be because in prehistoric times, liars posed a danger to the troop. But we've recently discovered there's a third form of problem solving that is emerging in the human brain. And we call it insight. Sometimes we call it an aha moment. Um, and we, you know, up to this point, we've kind of made those folklore. You know, Newton's sitting under a tree and an apple falls on his head and he discovers gravity and Archimedes sits in a tub and the water falls over, uh, over the sides and he discovers displacement theory. But it turns out it's actually a process, a neurological process in the head. And it seems to be the spontaneous connection of two pieces of data that you have never connected, never even thought of connecting before, and bam, you have a solution to a problem. Some people report this when they wake up in the morning some people when they're washing dishes, some people when they're jogging. Uh, th there's a lot of reports that come in. Here's the interesting thing, though. We can put, if you think about it, it's the first time we can put a skull cap on your head and watch what's going on under your skull. We've never been able to do that before. We didn't know how the brain actually worked. But we do now. And if you know anything about science, when you get to a point where you can predict that an event's going to occur, you're really on to something. And about 300 milliseconds before you're going to have a breakthrough and take two pieces of content that you've never married before and connect them as a solution to a very complex problem that's way above the pay grade of left and right brain thinking, a small part of your brain called the ASTG lights up like a Christmas tree. And bam, we run in there and we know that you're going to solve the problem. But here's the thing. The key to, to insight is loading content. You have to have the content. You're not going to solve a physics problem if you've never taken a physics course before. And this is where brain fitness is really making great inroads into education. I want to talk to you about brain fitness because this is huge. It has huge ramifications for education. It, we have discovered over a long period of time a very simple fact that the brain wants to be warmed up. It wants to be warmed up to accept content. If you and I are having trouble 
with a complex world now. Could you imagine being eight or nine years old? So these brain fitness tools, they warm up all various sides of your brain. And we've now given brain fitness to 23,000 students in Jacksonville County, in Oakland, California. And after four years, no changes in curriculum, no changes in computers, no changes in anything else. They have two times the academic achievement after, uh, two, after four years. It is, in my opinion, child abuse not to have children warm their brains up in the morning. And it's very simple. Very simple video games. If, if you have your pen out, write Posit Science, P-O-S-I-T. You can download these games. Give them to children in the morning. They won't even know their brains are being warmed up, but they've been designed by neuroscientists. This particular one is by Michael Merzik. I have no affiliation with the company. It warms up their peripheral vision, their memory, all of these things, and it allows them to accept content much easier. We're learning how the brain learns. I, want, I need everyone to understand, we didn't know how the brain learned before. We know how it learns now. And in fact, we're making such inroads, it is the first time in US history that a Mapping the Human Brain initiative was launched by the federal government, by the Obama administration. And if you know anything about what mapping the gene, human genome did to biological sciences, you know this is big and you need to be on top of it. So in conclusion, the first person to live to be a thousand years old has already been born. That is shocking. I just gave that statistic to the largest pension man, uh, uh, fund managers in the world, and they wanted to go out of the room screaming. They said, we're working on the person living 100 years. And I said, no, according to Aubrey de Grey in Cambridge University, the first person to live 1,000 has already been born. If we think we have compl a complex problem situation managing the states now, Imagine people living to a thousand. What does it mean? It means more data, more people, more ways. So we now know that a thriving society accommodates knowledge and belief, and then we hit an, a, a biological cognitive threshold. Our problems persist, they grow larger, they become more dangerous, and then we collapse and we start the ascension again. I suggest a new definition of collapse. Collapse is simply a, a, a reversal to simpler systems which are designed for our biological capabilities. Today, we understand barter. You and I meet in the road, you have some carrots, I have some eggs, we bicker a little bit until we reach a price, and then I give you some eggs, you give me some carrots, we go our separate way. What our brains don't understand are credit default swaps. We get confused when we get into that area. So we need to use technology to help us with that gap in terms of human knowledge. There are top attributes of high-performing states, companies, and organizations. They are fast adapters in terms of strategy, tactics, and technology. They, they strive for empirically-based policy, not politically-based policy. They all accommodate diversification and redundancy so as not to set, up, set themselves up for cataclysmic failure. And lastly, they have people in leadership that are preemptive and predictive and empowered to take action. And lastly, I want to leave you with this. My favorite, as an as a evolutionary biologist and a sociobiologist, my favorite movie in the entire world is Moneyball. Anybody see Moneyball? It's the best movie about the difference between empirically based de uh, decisions and emotionally based decisions. Prehistoric, paleolithic emotions getting in the way of progress. And I would suggest to you that if you ever run into an obstacle inside your organization, someone who's just dug their feet in, give them money ball. Give them a copy of that video. I keep like 50 copies, and, I, and any time I meet resistance, I go, let's watch this together. <laughs> you know, Because it's all about fast adaptation, and that's what we want to be about. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, and thank you for being on the vanguard of change.
Okay, everybody, thank you for uh, staying tuned in, and thank you, Rebecca. Um, real quick, we're going to work through some things. We've got a break coming up. You've got cards on your table. You can jot down a question uh, for Rebecca. She's also going to hang around here, as she said, and feel free to come up and chat and uh, dig into um, uh, that material. We have a couple of ARS questions to get through. What are the key barriers your jurisdiction currently has or has experienced in adopting a cloud environment? Government only. Regulatory compliance. Lack of contract vehicle to secure services. Data security. Integration with existing systems. Impact of cloud migration on existing staff. Performance. Availability of data. Confidence uh, in partners. And reinforced steel. I'll take a look at that one real quick, if you would. So it's something we've talked about a good bit uh, and will more today. Okay. Uh, our next question, again, for government only. When it comes to technology adoption and digital strategy implementation, we look to the private sector for best practices and strategies to take action to implement them. Government only. A, definitely. B, sometimes when we're able. C, we can't afford what private sector uses, so why bother? Uh, D, private sector is not a good example for us to follow. Or E, government is head of private sector. See what you think. Okay. Kind of heavy on the top couple of answers. All righty, we're going to have a break. We're going to go to take a break till 10 after 11 instead of 11. Um, remember the Twitter contest that you have, and uh, before you leave today, real quick, we're going to end with a video right before the break. This is one that Mark Bingle and his team put together. Uh, hope you enjoy it. See you at 10 after. As we all know, IT shops run on technology and the talent that supports them. As technology continuously grows, changes, and improves every day, so do the people who create it and maintain it. One of the challenges state government faces every day is having to produce more with less resources. Because of this, states must be on the lookout for the absolute best IT staff possible. Hmm. I wonder where I can find that talent. Siri. How may I help you? Which city has the most talented techies? Let me look that up for you. It looks like Nashville. Tennessee has the most talented IT personnel. Because Nashville is the music city, the state of Tennessee cannot just run on IT talent alone. They have to have a little more twang than that. Interesting. Would you like to see some of their team? Mark, their CIO can show you how he mixes up the beats in his state. Yes, please show me. Your wish is my command. First, you need some spectacular defense against cybercrime. The bad guys are really out there. Tonight's tonight, we'll make history. And I see all you and I. And I'll take any risk to safeguard this state of mind. Hunting down cybercrime. Next, you have to make sure you keep your customers happy, and that requires an amazing customer care center. Of course, you also need great shared services and networking teams. Check out this funky duo. And we all know that if you want to get any work done around here, 
you need a hard-working procurement specialist to make sure you actually get the goods. For you to really get grooving, somebody has to carefully design all of this technology. Not feeling so technically inclined? Don't worry! That's why you need a great technical writer to put together those detailed sets of instructions. Once you've got that part down, you're going to need some incredible storage space to hold all that jazz. That's why, darling, it's That someone, someone unforgettable. And last, but certainly not least, no IT workspace can be complete without a happy team of performance managers and quality assurers. Well, that was some mighty fine picking and a singing. Welcome to Nashville, Nassio. We're really excited to have you here, and we hope you enjoy the Music City. <laughs>